Hello, I'm Doc Peters. I'm an Aboriginal elder from Hillsville. My family um, mother was born on Corrin Derrick and my dad was born on Yorta Yorta. I work in with reconciliation, teaching people um, particularly how to make baskets, which my grandmother taught me to do, and um, also to talk about um, Aboriginal issues today and um, what's happening with, um, you know, I said I've worked in with reconciliation for 40 years, so um, that keeps me busy, which I, which I think is good. It's bringing people together. To bring people together, it's amazing the number of things that Aboriginal, that non-Aboriginal people don't know what happened to Aboriginal people, you know. I know that um, um, when our boys fought in the war and they came back from the war, they would go into a hotel with their mates and they wouldn't be served beer, they wouldn't let them have beer. The children wouldn't be allowed to go to certain schools. And um, if they were in a shop where there were non-Aboriginal people um, being served, they had to wait until they were served before they got there, before they were served, you know. And I remember thinking about this in 2006. And I thought something needs to be done about this. So I approached our um, local RSL and asked them to become involved in Reconciliation Week. You know, in the RSL they do the ode every day. You know, that you've heard that, I guess, haven't you? Mm. And um, some of the members were, were keen on it and some weren't. So, but the manager at that time happened to be um, Egyptian. So he was all for helping, you know, which was what they did. And it ended up with the RSL. And Andrew and his mate did a copy of the ode with the didgeridoo playing in the background. And um, the RSL played that all week in May, which is Reconciliation Week. I'd like to see it go further. Now, when the shrine heard what was um, happening, I got called to a meeting down there, and that resulted in um, them having a, a service at the shrine for the first time where they raised the Aboriginal flag. The governor was there, and all the big bods from the Army, Navy, and the Air Force, and um, they acknowledged Aboriginal import. And the following year, um, it went Australia wide. To me, it's terrific how you can get a bit of grass and turn it into something like this. Actually, you can make anything out of it if you want to. It's up to you. It's up to you. You know what you decide you want to make. They'd put it in the water, and the eel would go in there. And once it got down to here, it wouldn't be able to. That would, wouldn't be as big as it should be. But once it got down there, it wouldn't be able to turn around and come out. So they would just pick it up and take it like that, you know. If they didn't have these, what they used was rocks in the in the water. Where they wherever they see the eels the eels coming, they would put all rocks around and that meant that the eels couldn't get out of the, the rocks, so they'd catch them that way as well, you know. Gold that was found there. A big lump of gold that they found there. And they threw it away because it wasn't wasn't any good for them, you know. Didn't do them any good, so they just threw it away. You know, she died at 104. Never had a pipe out of her mouth or smoked. <laughs> but she was really a great person. Really, really, we really, really loved her, you know. She always taught us to respect the grass and everything around us, you know, taught us to respect everything. Uh, we go swimming, told us to be careful in the water, and just just made us very conscious of uh, where we were and what we were doing. And we had to really look after things, you know, not, um, not spoil things uh, as some people would do these days. Mm. They were there and, the, and the, the police would come down with beer and they'd give that beer to the men and then they would um, 
abused the, the women. And when Granny and them saw them coming, they used to run and hide in Kate Kelly's house, which is Ned's, Ned's mum, which I thought was really great. So I've got more of a time for Ned Kelly now than I had a while back. And there's a song written about him. Um, I can't think of all of it, but the last word goes, and if there's, um, when I look around at some people I know and the prices of things that we buy, I think to myself that perhaps after all, poor old Ned wasn't such a bad guy. And I think that's a terrific song, you know, and um, I've got a soft spot for Ned, right? Hmm. Well, we used to go and see Gran. Um, when when Corin Dirk Derek was closed, some people call it Corin Dirk, and it should be the two R's should be pronounced Derek. Um, when um, the, the, they closed Corin Derek, my grandmother and um, uh, the Denollys and Uncle Billy and Dan Russell didn't want to go to. Um, Camera guns, they wanted to stay where they were. And they weren't allowed to stay there, which is pretty pretty good, I think. And with Granny staying there, we used to go and visit her oh, three and four times a week. And that was when she um, taught me the baskets. Now, it's, now, I've got a photo at home, actually, of all the women sitting down and doing the baskets with the manager's wife showing them or looking at them. And I'm, I'm wondering if um, if she showed them how to do the baskets or if they did them. Cause I, I can't imagine them being in the bush and sitting and making baskets like this, you know, for three or four days or a week or whatever, when all they had to do was get a bit of bark from a tree. So it sort of um, just makes me wonder if, it, if the manager's wife didn't teach them this part, you know. But my grandmother taught me how to do that and, and I've done quite a few of them over the years. Our dad died a prisoner of war in the Burma Railway in 1942. So um, mum did a good job of bringing us all up. You know, I had three brothers and um, a sister. We never, never had anything um, um, Rachel in Hillsville grew up very, very happily there. It was a good when we got word that Dad had died, Mum owed the um, grocer and the butcher money, and they told her to forget it, which is what they were like in those days. You know, that's what, that's what people in Hillsville were like. Grew up happily there. Never, I never experienced any racism. I really, I would like to see it as a museum. I think it should be a museum where everybody who lived there uh, have an input into what happened sort of thing, you know. Perhaps sayings, um, photos, um, baskets, um, boomerangs, whatever, whatever somebody makes, they could put them in there, you know. Paintings, even what they do today, they could paint, somebody could paint. Uh, to talk to each other. I, I believe it should start in the schools. Um, yeah, by the time you're seven, up to seven years old, what you learned that time stays with you forever. Now, I believe that kids at school, they should have days where there are different cultures. It could be um, Japanese one day, Aboriginal another day. And the kids learn that and they learn to respect that culture. They learn to understand it and they learn to respect it and respect the, the children who are part of that culture. And that's something that I think that should be done at schools. I think culture is important to everybody, no matter where you come from. I think it's very important. With my son teaching what he does at school at Swinburne, I think that's great. Um, the little ones growing, growing up, they don't know much about Aboriginal culture at the moment, but they will eventually. I've got cousins um, and nieces and nephews who are involved 
and have only just become involved in uh, practically half of their lives, you know, which is good. I think it's great that they do that. Didn't live, they didn't live on the reserve like they used to, you know. Well, well, people moved into houses and they were, you were miles away, different parts. Different, you were miles away from someone who spoke the language. I think it's important for perhaps for some people to, to know the language. Not necessarily everybody, you know, but I, I think it's important to, to have the la language perhaps on a re record or something like that, you know. Taught me how to do it, and it's something that um, that I think is terrific. When you see um, something made out of grass, and it lasts can last a hundred years, you know, it's <laughs> a bit incredible, really, isn't it? None of us own the land belongs to Mother Nature, and I think she's showing everybody who's boss at the moment all over <laughs> the world. But um, um, uh, I've actually written a, a story about Badger Creek, Badger Creek River and the um, sanctuary and, and Mount Riddle. Well, next time I come down, I'll bring it in and show you. Them. It tells the story of the stones in the Badger Creek, mm -hmm. and it's about Bunzel the Eagle, who's the um, creator. And um, how he looked, they look after the people in the, the animals in the sanctuary, and how Mount Riddell was made because that's all out at Badger Creek. And um, I used to love Badger Creek when I was little. You know, I still do. I think it's a lovely spot. It's just the way it is. You know, I just um, uh, the uh, bush. I guess the animals, you know. It's going to rain today. We say, how do you know that, Gran? I can touch the mountains. That's what she'd say, you know, and look at her. And it wasn't until I got older that I realised she was talking about atmosphere. Now, if you live near mountains, you have a look. Some days they do look close. And when they look close, it rains. When they don't look close, it doesn't rain, which I thought was rather terrific. And it's, it, it, it's true. Yeah. That he was the creator. And that's like, um, like God. And Aboriginal people, the, the people I grew up with, not so much now, but the people that I knew as elders, um, they took to Christianity very easily because it was already in their hearts. They knew that there was a creator. They called him Bunjil um, and the snake. You know, but uh, it all depends where they came from. But most of them called him Bunjil and he was the creator. I think it's important for us to understand each other's culture. Um, we've got a great country, and I think we all need to work in together to make sure it stays that way. It doesn't matter that oh, I'm Aboriginal and you're not, and, and, and that we shouldn't be able to get along together, you know? I think that's important. And that's where, again, that business of teaching the kids at school, the different cultures would be good, because it's amazing when I talk to people, I do talk to a lot of people about different issues with Aboriginal culture, and um, it's surprising what people don't know. You know, the things that happened with kids and that, like, when the kids were on the reserve, if they wanted lollies, what they would do is throw the lollies on the ground and the kids would have to pick the lollies up from the ground, and things like that, you know, it's um, just terrible, but it happened. We need to, um, we need to sort of not dwell on the past. I don't think we should dwell on the past. We should look to the future and, and all working together to make sure that Australia stays a great country that it is.
as I said, when the, when the settlers came and they settled on their land, they really had nowhere to go. And um, sometimes they would steal the sheep and the settlers sometimes would shoot them. And that's when um, uh, the powers of be decided that the Aboriginal people needed to be looked after. And that's when they set up the reserves, which is what happened at Corrin Derrick. And, um, and it's good, you know. Oh, I just think it's great because they're, they're strong people. You know, very strong people and very um, um, oh, religious, I think is the right word for them. A lot of, not so much today as I said before, but the people that I grew up with, um, they were um, understanding of each other, cared for each other. Like Aboriginal culture is respect and caring and sharing, and that's what happened. They all looked at. There was one child. There was a child, just didn't belong to one person in the in the tribe. Belonged to everybody. I think probably just the caring, as I said, the um, um, caring for, for the land. None of us own the land, none of us own the land, as I said that before. Um, but um, it's, just, it's just that caring for each other and learning their own culture. A lot of our people need to have their own uh, a lesson in their own culture, you know, because they one of the main things about Aboriginal people was that they believed in the Creator. And as I said before, they took to Christianity very easily because that was already in their hearts. But that's gone out with a lot of our young ones today. And I think it needs to come back. I think it needs to come back for everybody. You've got to believe in the Creator. That's what keeps you going. It's such an important part of Australian history. And for me personally, it's, a, it's my family history, but knowing that that family history is so heavily connected to an important part of Australian history is really, it's a thrilling thing for me, really. And uh, it's, it's something, like a lot of Indigenous knowledge from the past, it's something that should be shared with everybody. Because I, I look at it from the point of view that I've missed out on a whole heap of knowledge and knowing so many different things and, and possibly living my life in a different way. But then I, I temper that with the thought that I don't want to sound like I haven't been happy with my life because I've had a wonderful life and you know it's almost wall to wall fun mm. in terms of memories that I've got and um, so that's an important part of it too and I, I believe that my journey was all about um, living essentially in a white man's world early knowing that I was connected to this culture but not really connecting to it until I was ready to do so and that came sort of as a, a late teen when I started inquiring a bit more an early adult when I really started learning and then developing the passion sort of once it started my academic career. So yeah, there's, it's, as I say, there's parts of me that wishes I had learned earlier because there are things I would love to know now, but hopefully I can learn those things now that you know, I consider myself ready to do so. Certainly mum's, mum's background has been the major motivating factor. Um, one of the key things to me, really embracing my Aboriginal heritage and making it an important part of my career was the connections that mum had in community, you know, I'd, I'd started this job and I'd meet people and I was amazed at how many people knew who my mum was and even now I meet people who I've never met before and haven't heard of before who know who my mum is or if they haven't met her they certainly know of her and how respected and well loved she is and, and that's a really important part of, I guess, affirmation for me that I'm on the right path and I'm doing the right thing and I also know how proud it makes her, you know, and I think it's, it's sort of a completion of, of a cycle in a sense that she's um, still passing knowledge to me but what she's doing is now starting another cycle and, and hopefully I can just be the next step in that in terms of how our family operates and um, I know mum's proud of the cousins I've got and her nieces and nephews and that all work in different areas to do with Aboriginal culture and sharing Aboriginal culture and enhancing and protecting and affirming Aboriginal culture to us all so and it's yeah it's a real a real sense of pride and connection that we all feel by working in this world and none of it would have happened without the support and, and the knowledge that mum had. This culture on me, she always made me very aware of who we were but um, it wasn't at the expense of anything else in terms of being accepted in the community 
for example. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm still not grappling with, but, but um, wondering is why as an Aboriginal family in Hillsville, we were so readily accepted by everybody that I was aware of, whereas other Aboriginal kids that I saw at school weren't so as accepted. And, and that, you know, that's something that I'll still talk about now and discuss and hopefully work out for myself. But knowing that mum didn't force anything on me because she wanted, um, she understood, I guess, the social position that our family was in was really important for me. And it's the same with my kids. They're lucky that they're growing up in a world that's much more accepting of Aboriginal culture than the one I did, which was much more accepting than the one mum did. So we're gradually making progress. But my boys are the same. I make them very aware of who we are as a family and where our cultural connections are but certainly don't impose anything on them or expect anything from them in terms of how they express their own culture. And I'll just leave that up to them and you know, I'll find, hopefully I'll find the same as mum did. Is they'll find a point in their lives where it becomes important to them and, and they'll be able to share it as well. It's just such an important part of who we are as a nation. You know, it doesn't just belong to me as an Aboriginal descendant. It doesn't belong to mum, it doesn't belong to Wurundjeri people, it doesn't belong to Yorta Yorta people, it doesn't belong to Tungurong people or any of the Kulin nations. It's just an important part of who we all are as a nation. And I see part of my job and my obligation now is to help make Australian society aware why this should be important to them and to help them connect with it and to help them see the value in it. And I only, and I have no doubt whatsoever that we're gonna become a better country and we're better people when we learn more about our own history. And it's just such a, a such an important passion. There are so many different elements to it, so many ways that it can be done. It's not something that needs to be imposed on anyone in particular. It's not changing anyone's particular set of beliefs. It's not really changing anyone's lifestyle. It's just getting them to look at the world in a slightly different way and accepting that this massive part of Australian history should be a part of their history as well. And for all of those reasons, and, and as I say, there are so many different aspects of society that we can learn and embrace Aboriginal culture in that it's just, it's you know almost a, a slam dunk for me. I hate using basketball references. It's a set shot from the goal square <laughs> for me that, you know, we all should be doing it and that's why I'm so passionate about it too.